constantly evolving. And every year, each of us adds some new points after being in the conference like this on some other places. And there's always a value addition in everyone's surgical technique every year. And when you, when you really have people come and speak, they are speaking on a very isolated part of the entire cataract surgery. But by this exercise, what we intend to do is that at one go, the entire crowd, the delegates, who are, of course, as good or maybe better than the faculty sitting here, can share can add some other points into there or may raise some questions as to why. Why you particular add this particular step in your technique for this year. So that is a whole exercise and we would like to start with our new entrant, Dr. Milin Kiledar, a dashing surgeon from uh, Maharashtra, Sangli, who will begin the innings with his take or what is different that he does in this year's cataract surgery. He's a prolific pediatric surgeon who also has a, a, a sizable and remarkable cataract practice in a town which is relatively a small town. And in fact, when you, when you look at some of the speakers in other, other meetings, you realize that such brilliant points can come from any part of the country. And that is what has been making cataract an interesting topic so far. Dr. Milin Kilidar. Thank you, Dr. Hardipurkar, sir, for inviting me to share my thoughts in what I did something different in this last year. <clears throat> All we know about effective use of uh, FECO energy by modulating the power is decrease the energy use, shorten the FECO time, improve efficiency that will cause less endothelial cell loss and thus having clearer corneas and improved outcomes. You can see that in this slide, Howard Fine has proved it beyond doubt that lesser the FECO time, better the visual equity in immediate post-operative period. So I decided to compare these two modalities of OZIL power in infinity machine, continuous OZIL versus burst OZIL. So what I would like to show you is a technique which you all can use to compare different modalities in your own hand. So what I did is I divided the nucleus exactly into two halves. So for the same grade of nucleus, you are using for each half two different modalities of power. And then at the end of it, compare the power used for both type of modalities of FECO power modulations and then see how much power you have saved. So I think this is worth sharing that if you want to study on your own a different modality is useful or not, this can be a very useful technique 
because you are comparing apple with an apple because you are dividing the nucleus into half now this second half i have finished with ozil burst mode and then doing such cases about 24 cases i did and compared the power utilization in both modalities this was the table and in the end in half of the nucleus i i have saved 20% of the power and if i utilize the same modulate uh, modulation in whole of the nucleus i would save about 40% of the power so this was the message dividing the nucleus into two halves and using different power modulations for each half is an exact method of comparing power use in your own hands second is i would like to show this case which was a very hard nucleus which we come across in india a small pupil post trabeculectomy i grade 4 nucleus and a shallow ac so all these things are against us i usually use a stretch pupilloplasty to dilate the pupil what point i want to make is we have been using various viscoelastics and our commonest or likely <coughs> viscoelastic is viscoat which we all like in such hard nuclei but in this case i have used a viscoelastic from orolab although i don't have a financial interest in that called viscoat which is also chondrite in sulfate and in such difficult cases that has worked well as good as viscoat and it has given me a clear cornea immediate post operatively so let us not go into all the details but dividing the nucleus into smaller pieces repeated use of viscoat or orocoat in this case and that's how you can get a clear cornea i'll just go to the last part which is the clearer cornea which you can see on the next post op day so the message is orocoat is equally good alternative to viscoat for endothelial protection next case i would like to share is a hydrophilic hydrophilic acrylic multifocal exchange with a smart toric and the earlier person had put a 30 diopter multifocal and on iol master what i got was 34 power and 32 power and 2.6 and 3.19 cylinders so patient was obviously unhappy because he had residual refractive error of plus 2 with plus 2 and plus 3 with plus 3 in the left eye so this is the calculation online calculation available for ultima smart toric which was planned and both being a hydrophilic lens and only 6 weeks post op it was easy to remove both the lenses from bag both the lenses were very well placed in the bag they were c loop haptics and not the plate haptics so it was even easier i have just put viscoelastic under the lens and lifted it up with the help of dialer and then with the help of mst set of forcep and scissors i have cut it into two halves in the ac and removed both the halves and have implanted a smart toric lens in both eyes this was specially ordered because the powers were 32 and 34 with t4 and t5 models this was a plate optic because it is a smart toric lens but even after 6 weeks of post operative period when the capsule was fibrosed i was little worried that whether i'll be able to put all the four haptics inside the capsular bag or not but it has gone very well and it was centered very well and i got a good result and the patient was happy because he got around 0.75 residual refraction which was minus and initially he was plus 
so we should not refrain from offering an exchange IOL option to our own patients. For myself, I have put a target of anything more than plus 0.75 to one diopter, especially on plus side, I immediately offer on myself that patient has an option of exchange IOL. <clears throat> Next, or the last case, that you may not be always wrong. Herein, I did a toric IOL of plus 15 diopters with T2 model for a 1.4 cylinder. And to my surprise, what I got was minus 7 with minus 1.5 cylinder at 100 degrees. Now, this was an extreme surprise for me. You may not get always such kind of surprises, but don't feel that you are, this may not happen to you. And this is what I saw under a special lensometer and I got a surprise that the power was 30 diopters. So after exchange, the patient was fine. So the message is you are not always wrong. Sometimes the others can be wrong and you have to suffer. Thank you very much for allowing me, allowing me to share my thoughts. With Thank you, uh, Milin. Uh, very nice messages. I just want to ask you one question. The lensometer that you use is a regular lensometer under which you can... It's a regular uh, lensometer, but it has got a different cap on which you can put a contact lens and intraocular lens also, and it can give you a correct reading. And with regards to refractive surprise, uh, for, for the benefit of uh, everyone, uh, if you have to choose between an IOL exchange and near corneal modalities or a piggyback, what would be your cho purchase choice? If it's a fresh uh, uh, case, say six weeks or up to six months also, I would choose a refra uh, exchange. Because for such a big surprise, minus seven or something, exchange will be better. For something lesser, like one or two diopters, I will prefer a sulcoflex. Well, what's your views on piggyback? That's what, sulcoflex. Do yeah. you go in for sulcoflex? For lower, lower surprises, I will prefer that. A any reason why not for bigger, uh, bigger diopters? Because, because those you, lenses... You have lenses in um, any power. Okay. I was aware that it is available up to three diopters. Only. No, 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 no. I will exchange, I mean, piggyback, piggyback with sulcoflex. Yeah. Uh, I think with any other lens. I think, I think sir, it, it, yeah. it has a higher limit because these lenses, if they're very uh, high power lenses, yeah. the optics become heavier and the haptics mm. do not support those lenses. Okay. So uh, up to two to three diopters they have and above that they specially manufacture the higher cost okay. but I think it goes up to seven or eight diopters, yeah. not yeah. beyond that. There's upper limit to it. Yeah. But any of the faculty has experience of using Indian fake lenses as piggyback? No, I have not. Uh, in Agarwal, they are using it. I have not personally used it, but uh, they are pretty good, they are saying. I, I have used, uh, and uh, I found, in fact, uh, when a patient with none of thalmas comes, and uh, like yeah, recently I had one with plus 16 fakey lens, I mean fakey uh, spectacle power. So instead of going for a primary piggyback, I decided, because he was requiring 64, I did the first with maximum power that's available, that was uh, 40. And uh, uh, it was not 64, it was 54. Then I had to put 24 extra. And then I decided to put uh, the, the fake specially made lens uh, with the required power. And surprisingly, it hit on the target. And except that all the time, I feel the AC looks a little shallower. The pressures are normal, the angle isn't close, but it looks a little crowded. But uh, the patient seems to be okay for six months. So I just wondered anyone and has... you have to do a PI for those cases. Oh, yeah, obviously. No question. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And now we have uh, Arup, uh, the guy who is uh, along with another uh, co-faculty like Dr. Amar, has been taking India across the borders to the international frontier. And we're very, very proud of him because we have seen his journey from just one of us to where he is today. Arup. Good morning, friends. Thank you, Dr. Suhas, for the very kind introduction. In fact, I owe you a lot uh, for my journey that, uh, that was kick-started with your help way back, maybe 15, 20 years earlier. Now, uh, these two books have worked out very well for me. Cataract Surgery in the Disease Die, Posterior Capsular Rent, Genesis and Management. 
and uh, they have I have put in a lot of effort, a lot of interest in these books, and I am sure they will be helping our fraternity, particularly the younger generation, to become better cataract surgeons. Now, on a more serious note, our surgery is an evolving process. New t techniques come in, we acquire new technology, and usually it occurs in a stepwise increments. In my presentation, I'm going to show you a couple of events uh, in the context of the, of, the, of the theme of the program, and I hope they'll be useful for most of you sitting here. Now, this patient had a anterior chamber lens, which was little undersized, and cornea is going in for a decompensation. So I decided to perform a L-shaped uh, incision, scleral tunnel incision, so that I still will be able to come out in a sutureless manner if everything goes on well. Patient's cornea was not too good, vision was 624, and it was the lens which was giving us to the problem. So a fornix-based conjunctival flap was uh, raised, as you'll see here, and after adequate cautery preparation and all that, uh, the, the surgery went off well. So the previous option for rigid lens, of course, would be you, know, you have to make a big tunnel incision and take it out through the tunnel, which you might have to suture it. So here I'm recording a cord length of six millimeters. The, the optic size of this particular lens is 5.5 millimeter, so it is safer to make your incision a little larger. So a six millimeter cord length is measured, and then a, at the center of this cord, another uh, three millimeter is measured off, you know, along the sclera. Then I made a vertical radial uh, incision, about 50% scleral thickness, and that was continued parallel to the limbus on the right side for about three millimeters. Then he used a sharp bevel up crescent knife, extend the tunnel, go about one or 1.5 millimeters into the cornea. You extend the incision along the scleral pocket, as you see here on, on the left side. Make sure that there is no button holding of the scleral flap or in the process there is no dog airing of the scleral flap that occurs. Because you know, the whole purpose of performing surgery through a tunnel incision will be defeated. So once that was, uh, the incision was appropriately prepared, uh, we uh, enter, I have not entered into the eye from the main incision, take a <coughs> MVR blade, inject a good quality dispersive OVD, a viscoat, to plug the area of the peripheral aridectomy to, un under the intraocular lens, under the anterior chamber lens, to plug the pupillary area, and use copious amounts of these to protect the corneal endothelium. Use the Sinsky hook to ensure that the lens is mobilized, there's no synechial uh, fixation of the lens to the periphery in, in the angle structure. And it is important because if uh, the lens, there is peripheral sinicae around the lens, you may you know, end up doing a lot of manipulations and there may be ble intraoperative bleed. So subsequently, the lens was rotated so that the haptic were aligned along with the main scleral incision, as you see here. One uh, problem that could arise here is that the one the haptic, sub-incisional haptic may go under the peripheral aridectomy, so you have to be very careful. So I injected OVD once again, a visco 20 to protect the, uh, to the, enter the vitreous behind the peripheral aridectomy. And using a 3.2 millimeter keratome, uh, entered the corneal valve was created about 1.5 millimeter, and it was carefully extended on either side. And then I created a second paracentesis incision. This was to facilitate intracameral maneuvering of the, of the intracular lens. So I uh, used a bimanual technique where the lens, the sub-incisional the haptic was brought in a visible area, use the MacPherson forceps, and pull the lens out. Now, retrospectively, you'll see that some vitreous strand has uh, been dragged, you know, the, so I should have performed, this is being again <coughs> shown in a, re, a, re, a replay, I should have perhaps, perhaps performed a anterior vitre, vitrectomy stain with, uh, after staining the vitreous with ramsolin acetonide. <coughs> so that was done uh, right now. So the anterior chamber lens has come out beautifully without any trauma to the uh, intraocular structures, and subsequently I injected triamcillone acetonide. It, this is a 40 milligram per ml solution, 4%, so I diluted 1 is to 10 or 1 is to 20. You don't really require such a thick staining of the vitreous. So once the vitreous has been highlighted, uh, we uh, go in with the bimanual technique of, uh, uh, it, was, it was done as, uh, several times because there are a lot of, it, some vitreous is coming from the area of the peripheral aridectomy. So I, I performed a bimanual vitrectomy removed as all the vitreous that was present in the anterior chamber. So you have to make sure that vitreous is not present in the anterior chamber. At the end of the surgery, the stromal hydration was performed. I was quite soft. 
So I decided not to keep the eye sutureless. Instead of that, I put uh, two sutures just to be on the safer side. That this patient should not have problems because of intraocular hypotony and wound leakage in the postoperative period. This patient has done quite well and he's awaiting secondary eye surgery. So this is uh, the second modification I would like to talk to you about. IL calculations in high, high we very frequently operate on patients with uh, extremes of emetropia. High myopia is very common. So I have uh, gone through a lot of problems. 15 or 20 years back, we realized that there's a lot of hyper, hyperopic error that was happening. Patients were la landing up undercorrected. So my dictum was to overcorrect these patients, target emetropia was minus one diopter for low myopias and for high myopias minus two. But then this is just a rule of the thumb. Hague is, uh, uh, is a good uh, formula, but then for you to get accuracy in this thing, it has to be triple optimized. You look at hundreds of cases, each lens type for each A constant. So I'm not really a big fan of this. Uh, 2011, Doug Koch and his group came up with the concept that optical biometry does not really tell you, the, give you the exact axial length, uh, even if it is using light, you know, laser to measure the length. Because in myopic patients, a lot of factors are there, which I may not go into right now. So it is important for us to adjust the axial length, even if you do an optical biometry. And then I played out with the different formulas, uh, new generation formulas like Barrett Universal 2 and Holiday 2. And this is the optimization constant. For various formulas, this is the constant. This is out there in the net, and any literature you'll find out. So for each formula, I have to I modify the axial length by this formula and uh, then find out the exact axial length. And this is the, this is the uh, sort of formula that I follow. Uh, this is my algorithm. Now, if the axial length is more than 26 millimeters, power is more than six diopters, I can I use either SRKT, not a big fan of Hages, or any modern formula, Barrett Universal 2, Holiday 2, Olsen, those of us who have got access to the Olsen formula, it is a paid site or it comes with some other machine too. So it's not a big deal. But if the lens power is less than six diopters, the lens is that time a meniscus lens. So effective lens position, a lot of changes uh, occur. So this is the formula that I would follow. I would use Holiday 1 with axial length adjustment, Hagis with an axial length adjustment, or Barrett Universal 2. But today, I really, you know, most of the time, I have calibrated the Barrett Universal 2 with all these modifications. I calculate IL power using all these mechanisms, all these, all these, all these uh, uh, formulae, uh, algorithms, and I stick to my Barrett Universal 2 for these patients. So do we have any time? Or I'm, uh, maybe another two minutes, Dr. Suhas? That will only eat into our discussion part. Okay, yeah. So unless uh, it's something different that you're doing this year, we can take this during the discussion part. Yeah. But uh, in the conclusion, I would request you to tell us, as per the title, what was it different that you did in the last year? That is what I think most of the crowd here is there to yeah. know about. See, earlier on, for explantation of rigid intraocular lenses, like anterior chamber lenses or even, even a, a posterior chamber lens, which was dislocated in the vitreous. So we, I used to make a large scleral tunnel incision. And uh, sometimes, you know, there are a lot of additions. It may be deep set tie. It may be difficult to make a large incision. So here I am, I am just doing entire surgery with just a three millimeter tunnel incision with a, with a radial uh, cut behind that's running posteriorly. So this, this way, basically, lesser tissue manipulation, less, less, smaller size of the incision, earlier visual recovery for the patient. So this is, I think, is a great uh, advance, uh, I mean, a great change which I have made in my practice while, when I have to expand a rigid intraocular lens. That's a beautiful point, and everyone will take it. Just the, the, the main incision, how big is that? It, uh, they make the six millimeters. Optic size is 5.5, .5, so you could easily make it 5.5 .5 also. No. Along with the, uh, uh, you know. On, on each side, it is three millimeters. Okay. The radial, radial cut is again three millimeters. Oh, right. The radial cut which goes posteriorly is three millimeters. Beautiful. And the other one is uh, three millimeters. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Aru. That's a definite take home point. Thank you. Now, uh, Aru, uh, you are going? Huh? Aru, you are going, na? Huh? Oh, sorry, uh, Partha, you are going, na? Yeah, I mean, we just uh, discussed. Advantage of l shape incision is instead of making a six millimeter tunnel, you're making a three millimeter tunnel, all right. If you make a three millimeter tunnel and don't give a relaxing cut posteriorly, you will not be able to get the lens, the rigid lens to the incision. So you don't really have to make an external cut of three millimeters and make a huge scleral tunnel. 
So basically here half is the scleral tunnel, other half is the scleral pocket. All the dissection is under the sclera. So the lens, uh, once it comes uh, into through the corneal valve, get, it gets delivered into the pocket and then it comes out. So post-op recovery is easier. You know, it is a small size incision, manipulations are less, and most of the time you should be able to keep it sutureless. Until now, is the, you know, there are complications like I has become very soft, where you know you need to put sutures. No, in this particular case, of course, you know we need a vitrectomy. So, see, it is basically dip, uh, dependent upon the, the type of OVD that you're using. If it is a viscoat, you know, it is uh, the, the pressure elevation postoperatively is less compared to HPMC and, you know, Helon GV or Helon 5. But nevertheless, if a lot of viscoat has gone posteriorly, and any, I'm doing vitrectomy. So, at the conclusion of the surgery, if there's a lot of viscoat in the posterior, in, in, behind the lens, I'll go with my vitrector. I'll remove as much of uh, the... HPMC re results in tremendous amount of pressure elevation in the postoperative period, and many a time, you know, in the, I learned it the hard way about 15, 20 years back. In scleral fixated cases where the eyes will be very soft and use HPMC. Now, of course, Dr. Ahmed has taught us to use the anterior chamber maintainer or the posterior chamber maintain uh, infusion. But then I, I, there's a case where I use a lot of HPMC to make the globe hard, and surgery went up beautifully. Uh, unfortunately, the patient had glaucoma for a very high pressure in his 60s for three, four days. I had to go in and I had to do a revision, I had to do a trabeculectomy. So after that, uh, you know, I mean, I've, this is what I have been following. Don't use HPMC whenever you have a PC rent. Thank you. Uh, and um, by the way, uh, any complications, um, any complication, either PC or anything, I think uh, vitrectomy, I think, is the uh, most integral part of cataract surgeon. So let's uh, take it as one of the machines we sh should have at whatever stage. Uh, thank you, Arup. Uh, that was a very good presentation with very good take-home points. And I request uh, um, uh, Dr. Partho to come over and uh, give his talk. And I request all the faculty, let's stick to the title. But most of us are really interested in knowing what is that single or couple of points that we'll dif do differently to make surgery a better surgery for us, for individually for me or anybody, than last year. That's the title. Let's please stick to it. But these are wonderful films that he showed. Very happy. It's always a big honor to be a speaker in Dr. Swas Haldipurka's course. And I wish to share today one very important aspect of surgery that is rexis. The importance of rexis, and I thought I would share this surgery, which I did a little differently this year. And I owe a lot of my learning of phaco emulsification to Dr. Suhas. And he was the first person way, way back when I first was doing my rexis. He was the first person who taught me how to do a good capsular rexis. So this is actually a tribute to him. And uh, posterior lenticonus is something when we come across it's a very rare disease, and it's, a, it's, it's as rare as approximately two to four children in a lack of children. So it's, the rarity is a fact, but also the possibility of a PC rupture occurring immediately as the, globe, uh, as the uh, rexis is done is actually a fact. And if such a thing happens, then one cannot put usually the lens in the bag. So I'd like to show you this video in which we did th something differently. And as you can see, this is a posterior lenticonus. We had, uh, it showed up as a small knuckle, and that knuckle was uh, identified, and we also could see the oil droplet sign, and also the atoll sign, in which there is a little bit of opacity right in the center. But the globe, uh, but uh, the posterior capsule was not very uh, visible in the rest of the places. So we go in uh, under anesthesia, of course, and uh, we take the capsular excess forceps, the micro excess forceps, and with a rexis marker, try and do a neat capsular excess as much as possible, grasping and re-grasping each time. <coughs> and using the OVD, 
to the advantage of creating a capsular excess as good as possible. The OVD has to be injected and re-injected and every time that you see that edit has come in, it means that some amount of OVD was re-injected. So after that, making a incision, the main port, and as we would do in a PPC, I separated the anterior cortex from the anterior capsule. And uh, I have to be very, very gentle in taking out the nucleus and the cortical matter. I do not do a hydro dissection because there is uh, the rupture in the posterior capsule and it can evidently come out. So what I'm doing is I'm taking out the anterior the cortex as much as possible it's very very soft and it comes out through the irrigation aspiration and I'm leaving behind that little plaque sitting onto the uh, the posterior lenticonus uh, the dehiscence of the posterior lenticonus and uh, this is the point that uh, I'm I'm re -in I'm injecting from the side port uh, viscoelastic and getting it out you can see very clearly now the fish tail sign where the cortex is actually hanging out and uh, now I try and carve out the posterior capsular excess now this I think would be very difficult and I, I know that I can lose this posterior capsular excess at any point of time but I'm going around that little opaque area which uh, is the opacity and uh, this is the importance of the atoll sign. The atoll sign means that there's some amount of fibrosis which has come in. And I am harboring on that fibrotic area of the posterior capsule and taking it around and uh, the posterior capsule rexis gets completed. So now with the posterior capsule rexis getting completed, so do a little bit of vitrectomy the uh, amount of uh, opacity that uh, is taken out by the vitrector and now we have that space between the posterior capsular excess and the anterior capsular excess and I can be assured that we can put in the lens in the back. So again increasing the space between the posterior capsule and the anterior capsule by the OVD and going straight in to the uh, space with the lens unfolding inside a single piece lens unfolding inside and you can see the very nicely stretch of the uh, optic as it goes in through an adequate haptic again putting in this uh, second uh, the trailing haptic has to be done very gently and you should manipulate with the knuckle so that it uh, very nicely goes in and of course you need to do uh, a wash and you need to see whether there is any vitreous left in the anterior chamber and once that is done the rexis uh, the uh, you can see the two rexes and the lens in between so this is in fact the first time that I could actually complete uh, a proper rexis in a posterior lenticonus the posterior lenticonus can be uh, of two millimeters it can be large it can be of seven millimeters and if it is large it usually gives way so this was something that I really did uh, which was new last year and it was the first time that I could get away with a proper excess the second case that I have a great pleasure again in showing is the the small pupil and the way that I have done the small pupil using the B-hex. The B-hex is an invention of my very dear friend, Dr. Suben Bhattacharya. And if you have not used it, do, do use it this year, definitely. And it's a fantastic device. And you can see that uh, this is a pupil that is small. And this is the cartridge in which the B-hex is actually there. So one makes uh, an incision. And then you just need to put that cartridge. and simply take this thin very flimsy but a very strong and stable it is flimsy yet strong and stable uh, this hexagonal ring into the anterior chamber under the viscoelastic cover of course and it has this little little holes which you can with the manipulator which he has provided and it can simply snuggle in very swiftly and very nicely some parts of this uh, uh, this video clip I have slowed down so that we can see how it can be snuggled in and once uh, and I'm as a right-handed surgeon I put in all the holes and uh, tuck in 
the flanges through the right hand and the flange that is near to the right hand can be moved out and go to the far periphery on the other side so that you do not have to exchange your hands and you can see that these holes in the flanges are so nice and uh, they are so uh, appropriate that they do not stick to the uh, uh, to the manipulator and we have made a 5.5 millimeter mark on the cornea and uh, we are able to do a very good capsular excess now <clears throat> after that of course you can see though uh, it is so thin again the stability however hard the cataract is of course this is not a very hard cataract but however hard the cataract is you can see the stability of the anterior chamber and you can see the wideness of the pupil so adequate and uh, absolutely in uh, in proper place so once this has come out all that you need to do is to put in the intraocular lens and once the intraocular lens goes in the removal is also very very nice the intraocular lens see you can see that uh, the wideness of the pupil is maintained and this is uh, placing the intraocular lens under irrigation that again is very much possible and uh, something that uh, Shuben did not really uh, feel very happy about I, I told him can I take it under irrigation can I take out your BHEX under irrigation he said don't try it use a little bit of viscoelastic but I did not uh, uh, mean to uh, I mean go against him but you know it can swivel around like this but it can also be taken out under irrigation because the irrigating cannula that you have the port is facing downwards and the BHEX ring is between the uh, cannula and the intraocular lens so you don't really disturb the corneal endothelium and you can simply take it out either with the forceps or with uh, the manipulator and this is it so this is something I think any of us who have used something in the small pupil and if you have used the BX, I'm really proud to have used this new device which I had not used and this was something very new this year for me and I really wish that you'd use the same for this year as well in your small pupil cases. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Parto. Now I uh, invite uh, Dr. Amar. Uh, well, I don't have to introduce the, the two true international uh, uh, ophthalmologists from India and who every year has been offering to the world a newer concept, newer technique, or newer take on the existing techniques. And we are, in a way, indebted to him for some of the value addition that we have done in our own procedures. And with this, we have Amar this morning. Thank you very much, Suhas. Thank you. First of all, it's a pleasure to be with Suhas in his course here. And Suhas is something, someone who has done so much for ophthalmology globally. He conducts a hands-on wet lab internationally every year where it is snowing in Europe. And the people there who attend it always talk to me about Suhas and how much of education he's doing for everyone. Now, a new thing which we have just worked on is this technique called the triumvirate technique. This is coming out in the JCRS perhaps in a couple of months or perhaps the January or the February sheet might come out in. I'm not sure exactly, but it's already in print. Now, the principle here is very simple. Triumvirate basically means three techniques rolled in one. Now, imagine I'm starting to do the phaco emulsification and suddenly you seem to have a rent. And what's happening? The nucleus is started to sink. Now, when this is happening, immediately you will realize, stop the phaco emulsification. First step is, try to bring the fragments out. Charles Kelman started this technique of the posterior assisted levitation, which was then popularized by David Chang and Richard Picard. Now, the next step is, and I was discussing with Suhas just now is, when you have a rent, First thing, don't inject viscoelastic. Immediately put in fluid in the eye. So you can use a trocar AC maintainer or a trocar cannula, either way, whichever is comfortable to you. The principle in an AC maintainer is you have to make a knife entry and put an AC maintainer inside. 
A trocar ACM just goes in just like a trocar cannula of the retina, guys, but it is anterior to the iris. Next step, I'm making scleral flaps. So once you have scleral flaps, I'm making a 22 gauge sclerotomy one millimeter behind the limbus. Do not go very posteriorly. Now, I don't want the fragments to fall down. So I'm doing a modified pal where I'm using this sclerotomy and I'm passing a globe stabilization rod, you can notice. And I'm just going to lift this fragment anteriorly above the iris. Once I have done that, my fragments are there. I have fluid in the eye. Remember, I'm doing a bit of vitrectomy. I don't have now vitreous in the area above the iris. I now take any three-piece IOL of your choice and inject it inside the eye. Now you can see I've got a good iris support. So all I do is one haptic has gone above the iris. The second haptic now goes also above the iris. What have I done, ladies and gentlemen? I have moved to the second technique. Remember the first was I showed the PAL and the modified PAL. The second is I have created my own posterior capsule. In other words, I have created the second technique of the triumvirate, which is the IUL scaffold. Now I go in with the fake emulsification and you can see I have an air pump on, a gas forced infusion which we always work on in all our cases. So I have a deep chamber, I'm away from the endothelium also and I'm removing each piece fragments comfortably without the fear of the fragments falling down. So far so good. Now we move to the third portion of this triumvirate which is moving this IUL posteriorly and making it into a glued IUL or into the sulcus if you have support. Now I'm doing some vitrectomy here, clearing of the cortex and the epinucleus. Removing cortex and epinucleus is comparatively easier, but remember, what did I do? The pupil was small, which invariably happens in PC ruptures. I dilated the pupil. And the best is to dilate it with iris hooks because it's very comfortable and safe, doesn't have any fear of falling down. Now, once I have done that, I've dilated it very well, removed all the fragments. I go inside always and check because this takes me a few minutes extra to check. And if some cortex has fallen down, it's very easy to just remove them even if they are lying over the fovea there. Check everything. Disc, macula, all is okay. No issues there. Now, I need to convert my IUL which is in the eye above the iris to an IUL behind the iris. So look, I'm using two hands. So I'm using the handshake technique and you can notice my assistant is holding an endoluminator from outside which helps me see better. So you can see now transferring from one hand to the other, catch the tip of the haptic. Remember if it's your finger and you're pulling it out, you need to catch the tip so that it does not break. Once first haptic is out, I catch the second haptic and I have pulled the second haptic also out. Once both haptics are out, now assess. See the amount of haptic externalized and notice carefully I've got enough haptic externalized now all I do is take off my iris hooks, create my Gabor chariots pocket, lovely thing started by Gabor from Germany, 26 gauge needle, tuck the haptics inside. So before I do that, I'll check with a globe stabilization rod, the tunnel is correct or not, tuck my haptics inside. Now at this stage, you can now bring the pupil down. So that's the next step which I'm going to do is inject some intraocular pilocarpine. I've injected that bringing the pupil down. Now look how the eye is looking. Finally, you can also inject some triamcelone to see, do you have any vitreous lying above the iris? And if it is there, you'll be able to catch it very well. So ladies and gentlemen, basic concept which I did here was now ending it with air in the anterior chamber, finally with fibrin glue. So to conclude, what is this new thing which we have started is a triumvirate technique where we are combining three techniques for sinking nucleus. One, lift the nucleus up, do the PAL or the modified PAL. Second, create a posterior capsule of your own by the scaffold and emulsify the nucleus comfortably. Three, put the iris hooks and transfer that IUL to behind the iris. Either can put it in sulcus if you have good support or a glued IUL. And that completes the triumvirate technique. And as I said, it's coming out in the JCRS soon and you'll be able to see it perhaps. Thank you very much.
Thank you, uh, Amar. Uh, as always, you show us cases, which is a tough act to uh, really repeat. But then if you are at it, I'm sure we should be able to get it someday. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like you to, in case you don't have any engagements, to be with us because we can have lively discussion. And now we have Dr. Kumar. Uh, Kumar, uh, please uh, uh, remember that we are very keen to know what are the new things that you do or different things that you do this year in your practice. Please. First of all, uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, Dr. Suhas, uh, respected sir, thank you very much for this opportunity given to me. Uh, I'm going to talk what about what new that we've done. We've just got an image-guided laser, image-guided cataract surgery. We also got flax in our, our system. And one more thing I do is non-FACO laser cataract surgery. And we got a new camera and a recording system. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the image-guided system. See, when I tell you that the incision has to be made at 160, here is the beauty. You can actually see where is 160, and you can actually make your incision at 160. So this is just the accuracy of image-guided cat uh, image cataract surgery. So it does work quite well. How accurate is our marking? Now, mind you, friends, one thing that I've done here, these three marks that you see is made by the bubble marker, ASICO. And this is a corneal marker for centration of your CCC. And on this, I will put Videon technology, which is used for image guided, to see how accurate is what we are manually doing and how accurate is, is actually our Videon technology, which is the image guided. And you'll be surprised here at the accuracy. Sorry about that. Uh, about the accuracy that if you put the Videon on and you take the blue thing on, you can see 180 degrees straight, 90 degrees here. So our original in mark is as accurate as the image guided cataract surgery. The blue circle that you see is actually the marking of the cornea. Now, coming to CCC, of course, we would like to have a CCC, and you can see what is written there, a rexus of 5.5 on the visual axis. So this is what we are getting today. Uh, we all know that the lenses will center in the center of the bag, but if you want to make it on the visual axis, it is quite possible. And once you've done your rexus, Remove the cataract, you can re-measure your excess. Whether it was 5.5 is what you thought it was or not. So I've removed the cataract now. I'm filling in a viscoelastic and I'm re-measuring the excess. So this is also possible as far as the image-guided technology goes. So this is one thing that is quite easy. Then coming to toric placements. Now if you have to place an IOL at 84 degrees, it's easy to mark 84 but not always easy to create it. So here we are creating the rexus, which is there. We can, you can see very well the rexus is 5.5. We go ahead, and now we want to put a toric IOL at 84 degrees. This is centration for the IOL. We take in a toric multifocal, and we want to place it at 84. Now, you can do it with manual marking, but a 84 can be 83, or it can be a 86. So how to make sure that it is not that, I'm going to go ahead and take the lens and then we place it. This is a multifocal uh, symphony toric IOL and we go ahead and place it in the bag. And when we place it in the bag, you'll see how accurately you can actually place it. So here it's a guideline that yes, it goes perfectly in the bag. And then there are three or four dots depending on which IOL you use. That will align with your this line, which is the 84 degree. So you can see there are dots here, and there are dots here, which are near the incision. And at the end of the surgery, if that is aligned, uh, it is very well. So additional benefit that you get from the image guided is to make sure that your alignment is perfect, your centration is perfect, and it goes quite well. So what is the benefit of image guided cataract surgery? It marks the incision and the side port, the sizing of the CCC and the placement on the visual or limbal axis. Remeasure the CCC, toric placement, centration of the IOLs. This is not where it ends. Regarding calculations, you know your K reading, calculate the IOL with different formulas, you know your end result, refractive error, to calculate your surgical induced astigmatism, and to calculate an individual A constant for each IOL. This is also possible on image guided cataract surgery. So, this will give you additional benefit. We also added to our armamentarium the uh, FLAX system. You all know ICC, ECC, SAGS, and then we go to MICS, and now it's FLAX. I am of the opinion that it does not slow you down. It makes your CCC faster, hydro procedure faster, lesser FACO energy, and lesser incision time that you spend. Now, just want to show you the ease of the CCC. Just watch. The CCC is ready. It's a floating capsular excess there. What you have to just go in and pinch it like a handkerchief and come out. Another advantage of the hydro procedure, you don't have to struggle. You already have a pneumatic dissection. 
So when you do a hydro procedure, the fluid finds the same plane. So there is no struggle. Just watch the fluid wave, one injection, and you see a nice, slow, gradual fluid wave progressing. You can see the fluid wave being formed, and you can see the fluid wave slowly forwarding in this direction. You can see at this level it is going forward, and that's so it's very, very easy to do hydro procedures post-flax. It's very, very comfortable, very, very easy. That is one thing. So I'm of the opinion it is fantastic for subluxated cases, a nice CCC in small pupils, heart cataracts. Don't forget posterior polars. You can actually see the posterior pole. So this is a subluxated case, and you can see how the, actually the scanning happens. And if you go ahead and do the uh, femto on this, I want to show you one thing here, which is additional, that I have done a CCC. The subluxation is this, particularly the CCC is away from uh, this area of subluxation. But this is very easy. Just remove the... Um, CCC which was done, then do irrigation aspiration, go ahead and put an endocapsular ring. What I want to show you is, don't forget friends, that was the area of subluxation, that when we put a lens, put an endocapsular ring, the lens will center in the center of the bag and not where your CCC is. So here I'm putting the lens through a small CCC and the IOL beautifully centers in the center of the bag. So if you have a system which actually scans the whole cataract and takes out a geometrical center, your CCC will be on the geometrical center of the cataract and not the CCC. So even if you plan your CCC on the visual axis, the lens will sit in the center of the bag and not where your CCC is. So this is what I feel is very, very important and a big advantage that we get in FLAX. Even Zapto will not be able to give you this. Another one thing that I want to show you is a new technique which is called non-FACO laser cataract surgery. So we've invented a cannula which is like this. It's an irrigation aspiration cannula with a FACO tip. So we just attach a FACO tip to the irrigation aspiration handle. It's just like any other FACO tip, and you are just attaching it to the irrigation aspiration handle. Once you've done that, on that we put a sleeve. Once the sleeve is attached, uh, we just go ahead. Now the question is, what happens if you have hard cataracts? What I'm showing you is a grade 2.5. I'm not using a FACO uh, probe at all. I'm using the cannula which we formed. Just remove the rexis. Go ahead and put the same FACO probe, and you'll see what happens. There's no FACO energy being used. There's no shutter. There is no chatter. The piece remains at your place. It's just an irrigation. Look at chamber stability. Brilliantly well-maintained chamber. Excellent stability. You can go ahead and aspirate the whole cataract out because they've become small cubes. There are sectors at the same time, and there's no FACO energy. This we have done till grade 3, 3.5, and we are doing more experiments with this laser system so that we can even do it for grade 4. So this is another new thing, which is called non-FACO laser surgery. And the last thing is this. So we've got a new Sony camera, and if you see this photography, you see beautiful depth perception. Um, and you can see an excellent resolution. This is a three-chip HD recording. Uh, you saw the rexes being removed and a nice fluid wave going. So I think photography is also very, very essential for people who are doing lots of presentations uh, all over the world. And this is an essential uh, requirement for a good technology. So you can see excellent depth, good quality of recording, uh, which I think is essential for every uh, ophthalmologist who does lots of presentations. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Kumar. Uh, you are a high-tech guy from Bombay. And you have lived up to your reputation by bringing in new technology. And thank you. Thank you, and sir. I would request you to be on the panel because we'll have some good discussion. Is Dr. Gaurav Luthra there? All right. I, I think I will take, uh, since I was to take the last, I'll take now. Friends, my, our talk today being on what's different that I did in the cataract surgery this year, I have uh, restricted to some of the thoughts from the very basics because cataract surgery starts not at the high tech level, it also starts from the basics. So if you find me only talking with the slides and not the film, uh, please uh, excuse me because uh, tr passing on some of the concepts that I do was, I felt, more important than sharing the films with you. And to start, I would like to bring you this uh, very interesting slide 
that was shown in the American Academy in the year 1911. Today, cataract surgery has attained such a level of perfection that nothing better needs, nothing more needs to be done to make it better. Now, even today, I do not dare make such a statement because it's indeed the most dynamic, volatile procedure uh, that has held me at the edge of the seat for the last several years of our professional lifetime. I did travel backwards to tighten the loose ends and consolidate on the collective wisdom of the day. There are several steps we hear, we listen to, we discuss about, but when we go back into our practice, you will share with me, you will agree with me, that we stick back to what you are comfortable with. And then, after some time, you tend to forget what you had heard. But if only you take down notes and try it out, because the classic example is BHEX, the Dr. Partho was talking about. Now, some of us, or most of us who are using Malugin's ring, we've been using it for some time. Remember the early days when we did Malugin's? It was a little clumsy to get in and get out. But today, it just goes in easily. That means we're used to it. Today, BHEX uh, pupil expander is an excellent technique, excellent device, cheaper one. But you find it little, uh, you know, because you're not used to it. Maybe four or five times. The reason I give you this example is, this is what happens with every step that we do. So it's always better that you travel back and um, introspect over the collective wisdom. I realized that in your busy practice, on the first post when the patient comes, we tend to ask him, how are you? He says, I'm fine, and his vision is good, and that's it. If you closely examine his slit lab examination for cornea, you always find, in spite of the best surgery, a little bit of corneal uh, wound stress, a little bit of DM folds, which may be slit lamp, doesn't tell you immediately, but a direct ophthalmoscope or a good glow, you can make out that there are a few DM folds and sometimes they, they last a little longer. And, you know, the patient occasionally says, well, I see 6-6, six, six, but then, you know, it's not as clear. Or he says, if he's operated for the other eye a month back, he says, this eye is better. The reason is those things, is it possible to get over that? A close examination at the way we use our energy during the surgery can definitely, definitely help us get over that. So it will be like, for me, a personal victory if I see my patient first post-op day, and if a patient in whom I have done a prelex, and in someone in whom I have done a dense cataract, if both of them can have a similar corneal endothelium the first day, then I would say that that's my personal victory. And my t this year's journey has been looking at it and finding out, can I? Because I know for sure when you do on a do a prelex, where you hardly use any fake energy, you're hardly there for any time in the eye the cornea tends to be better. Why it's better? The difference is only in the amount of time and amount of energy that is used, amount of fluid that has gone and come out. Can we reduce it? I paid little more attention to the wound details and looked closely at the astigmatism, which guided me in my incisions and uh, energy utilization. Well, for years together, I was a very, very, um, very open and uh, a big advocate of limbal relaxing incisions ever since they came, and I did them very proudly. But over the years, I have realized that one, they are not predictable, number two, they don't last long. So it was more of my own personal satisfaction that I did an LRI for this patient at the end of the day, uh, that LRI really didn't work unless it was, let's say, 3.5 and I did LRI and then it came to around 1.5 and I was happy that, oh, at least this much I could reduce. But at what cost? At the cost of causing so much of aberrations into the cornea, that today for me, uh, LRI goes back to the side, to the place where my RKs, AKs and uh, transverse Ks are resting because you have you have excellent array of toric lenses. 
and our knowledge of toric has improved so much i always like to uh, you know share how when the toric lenses came in the beginning it was educated as it's very easy there's nothing new that you need to do it's just saying sort of putting a monofocal you put toric and that's it but no today toric requires a huge work up and uh, just now dr kumar was talking about varion and callisto and all that if you want to go that extra one more step there's so much there is to do and that's the reason i always feel it's so exciting that every day we keep on improving our cataract surgery in spite of doing it every day and we are thankful to that uh, to the providence for providing that technique now 2.3 and 2.4 have taken place of 2.2 sometimes uh, depending upon the type of catometric profile and the type of lens insertion that i use now i was using those mics lenses with a promise from the fact company that well if it goes through 2.2 it goes sometimes sub 2.2 but when i actually started doing a study using intra operative size of the wound that i was causing soon after the keratome goes in and soon after the lens goes in to my horror there were some lenses which would consistently make it 2.3 instead of 2.2 that i began with but there were some sign lenses which were sincere enough to their promise so once i know that i know there's absolutely no prop, no point in literally sticking to 2.2 and putting a stress on the bone so safely i would go to 2.3 sometimes 2.4 and if it's against the rule i have no hesitation and if i feel that this patient can do better uh, with a three piece i would certainly go for it i am uh, openly has been a very great proponent of three piece lenses over the so many years and now that i have seen my three piece results after 15 years after 20 years and i'm amazed at what a performance a three piece does as compared to a single piece the only drawback today is that you need 2.8 and there are several cases in practically everyday cases where 2.8 is just okay there is nothing great to stick to 2.2 if there's already an against rule astigmatism those are the cases where i would very ho happily put a three piece lens in the back to get that beautiful result so you're not talking about result tomorrow you're talking about result is the days from now years from now and that's what a three piece lens promises well efficient functioning a quieter eye minimal energy and a min minimal any universe in your utilization and of course the quick surgery they do not go hand in hand i often come to a conference go back to press because some of our friends do their phaco surgeries in 5 minutes and 4 minutes and i wonder oh my god i take so much time it doesn't really hurt because to your patient that's the eye so if i take a minute or two more but i take care of these small small things it is still worth it i have experimented this year with lots of mix and matches of phaco tips and hand pieces and tried them on various different uh, phaco machines wherever it was possible and then of course i tried of uh, per combinations of parameters and energy deliveries to just see if my phaco time can come down my turbulence in the eye can come down my eye can see uh, look quieter the next day and to an extent i have realized that yes it is possible in the eyes where the tip can go on to another phaco hand piece and there are some tips like i can talk of a tip called easy tip from earthly which easily goes on to a new machine from the amos which is uh, intuitive and that's a beautiful combination in my hands where i can en increase energy never be worried about wound uh, wound stress because they're all high infusion sleeves so that way i think one has to keep doing with the things you have at your disposal well the premium lenses like toric the preloaded the trifocals and now of course the hybrid lens called symphony they have finally come into my uh, practice in a big way and their acceptance has also improved probably because the pre these uh, multifocals and trifocals and premium lenses they have improved or oh, much better than that our understanding our confidence in those lenses has improved so today when i offer a multifocal lens i do not really is so much concerned as i was last year and i, I tell them but 
with clear, clear under note that these are the drawbacks, no matter what you're going to get, and you're, going to, you're buying them for, and patient accepts them. Well, several new instruments designed by our own friends have appeared on my surgical table, and surprisingly, they're doing very well. Sanjay Choudhury's irrigation cannula in my biomanual is a regular feature. Banaji's eye lock is something that I always use. Suven's BHEX is there wherever required. And recently, uh, I'm, uh, it'll be a ple pleasant, it's pleasant to note that, you know, this innovations can, from, can, can come from any corner. Dr. Rana from uh, Ahmedabad, you know, he has designed a chopper. And recently when I went there for a live surgery, he said, sir, would you like to try it? And then gave it to me. First, I was a little skeptical about the design. But then I asked him again on the phone. I said, how exactly do you use He said, no, nothing. I just use the same way as this. And then I tried it. And to my great surprise, it's such a beautiful, simple, extra addition. So that means keep your minds open. There are lots of innovations our innovative mind from India is doing. Pick them, try them. They're good. They're good. And all in all, it has been an interesting year. And I wonder how far will this never-ending affair with the same cataract surgery will last. Thank you so much for this wonderful lesson. Is Dr. Lutra there? Fine. So uh, can we have some questions? If, if any of you have any questions, we still have some time. Uh, yes, please. Please. So as you are talking about the three-piece lenses yes. that you are finding more and more. So in what way you are thinking that uh, these three-piece lenses are better? Yes. One, their ELP doesn't change much. They stretch the capsule, like uh, which which single piece can never hope to. They keep your pupil, I mean the rex is pretty well opened up. And most important and all, that uh, years later, if you really want to, mm, you know, have a clear PC without, of course not. I'm not talking about PCO. Even the PC stria, which sometimes can cause problem, and so sometimes they can induce PCO formation in high maps. That is avoid. It is about silicon lenses also, three-piece silicon? Or, uh, if you Acris, ask me... Or Acris of three-piece. Yeah. My bicep. Can I just take two minutes? Please. Yeah. Yes, of course. I tell you, when I was talking right now, I was not talking about uh, silicon because silicon is anyway out of our minds. But when I see my silicon lenses of years back, except for little sheen, little yellowishness, they are wonderful. But today we put yellow lenses, yeah. so it doesn't really matter. But no, I was not talking about silicon, I was totally talking about uh, acrylic lenses. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Has anybody got any data of patients with uh, yellow lenses having developed ARMD? <laughs> I, See, because I, have, I have yellow lenses which have become opaque. Oh, you have yellow lenses which have become opaque. Amar, what about you? You put yellow lenses or you don't put yellow lenses? Okay. We still have 10 minutes, Gaurav. Sure. Yeah. Uh, any questions we can always take now since we have taken a break. Yeah, please. Ajay. Have you compared night vision in Alcon Acris of IQ versus Technis? What is your experience That's a lovely regarding question. the night, night vision and uh, uh, quality of the vision in the night time? while driving between these two lenses? Well, I don't want to get into controversy, but here we are comparing two different platforms. Now, Technis is based on a platform which has definite certain clear-cut advantages, and then we compare it with another also a kind of a acrylic lens, except that it's slightly yellowish. Now, that yellow color, its usage is anyway debatable, but if you talk about the glistening part, you would always get it after a few years. And glistening part to our eyes, it may not make a difference, but if you are checking the pure quality, a glistening will give you a lot of lens, light dispersion and brings down the quality. But I have not seen a night time difference. And it is not expected, uh, that's what I thought. But anyway, uh, that's a controversy, let's not talk about it. But I have not seen Thank you. Yeah, Parto. Hello. Yeah. 
Last yeah, question okay. before. Uh, um, Hello. Uh, I'll just uh, sorry, about the, the post of day one, mm. the subtle changes that uh, endothelial changes that you see a little bit of fault. Mm. What changes have you done to correct it? That's all because you had come and to that yeah, point. Yeah. And anything about the where you are doing FACO, are you going back and seeing? Or have you used uh, mm. more viscoelastic or less viscoelastic? Some maybe viscose. There, there were certain steps like. The quality of uh, viscoelastic, meaning I always go for a combination of sodium halon to chondroitin, that's one. What I do again is uh, I also inject a little more after the hydro before my thing goes in, which many others do routinely. I was never doing that. Number two, I stick to in the back truly till almost the piece is about to be emulsified. Only then that single piece I take out, do it and go down. And thirdly, use all the FACO energy to see that, you know, the amount of uh, energy delivery in the eye, if it can be kept to minimum eye care. That's it. That's it. And, and then about the wound. When you have a wound which is tight, it's always under stress. Sir, can I? Yeah, yeah. Hello. Can I? Uh... Please. This is about LRI and the statement that you made to include them in the Hall of Fame. Okay. I think that pretty much concludes. Thank you yeah, very much. It, it's a wonderful technique. There's no question. Sure. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Aldi Purkar, sir, for uh, giving me this opportunity. I apologize for, you know, getting stuck uh, in the other hall and uh, just rushing in. So, if I can have my slides. Okay. Great. So, <clears throat> I just wanted to share a couple of things that I've been doing uh, this year now. I have been using a Virion, which I think Kumar also spoke about, and I won't speak on Virion because uh, the, what happened is that uh, when I started using Virion in one of my OTs and started using that for the Rexis, I started getting my Rexis really, really well. So what that did was in my second OT, I started feeling the need for a Virion-like device, and I didn't have any. So uh, we went back to something which I had used almost three, four years back, and last one year now I use it completely for all my cases. It's a, basically a simple Rexis marker because... It just, uh, you know, this Rexis marker uh, is available by several uh, names, but uh, I worked with Epsilon and we innovated to develop a design which really works well for me and I just wanted to share how it makes life very simple. So although this is a Virion overlay which shows you how my Rexis will coincide with that on the Virion, but if you notice here, uh, this small Rexis marker which costs just a few hundred rupees gives you a very nice uh, mark to work with. And uh, this indentation is so little that it mark goes off by the time you finish your surgery. And I would really want to uh, encourage all my colleagues here to think about using this. It gives you almost the perfect size each time. You know, in a bigger cornea, in a smaller cornea, you will always get the right size because when you don't have a mark to work with, your size can go wrong by almost a millimeter or two this way or that. So this mark disappears by the time you finish your surgery and it's only there. So it gives you a perfectly round, nice femto-like rexis in every case. And I think uh, this is a great useful tool for uh, making your rexis right. It takes just one extra second to use, but just see how nicely your rexis comes out and it coincides with what you might get with a virion. So now, uh, in fact, I don't depend upon virion at all and I use the Rexis marker in both my OTs, I feel it is actually superior to the Virion system in some, time, some cases because the Virion system can actually move around. Now, in this case, I wanted to just demonstrate how, uh, you know, the Virion can actually go wrong while this mark will not go wrong. So, uh, if you just uh, watch there, we'll do this Rexis with the uh, Rexis marker mark. Uh, once that you follow the marking on the ring and then you can just watch that in the towards the later part of the procedure we check it and the virion actually went off you know so virion is actually moving off because it's trying to detect the landmarks and sometimes the virion will not come out well That's, just watch here this is almost a perfect rexus like what you would get with the virion system anyway so this is a nice simple rexus marker and uh, i think uh, just very very easy to use now this is an, another uh, thing which i wanted to share with you uh, in pediatric cataracts, when I started doing Torix uh, in some of the 8 to 10 year olds, occasionally I used Torix. I did not want to suture the wound. So about a year or two back, I, I thought of uh, a way that um, I would not have to suture these wounds. And it has really worked well. And I actually use this to seal the wounds in my pediatric and adult cataracts in many patients, even uh, who are like 4 or 5 years old. 
it seems to really work well, uh, but so much so also in adults. Now just watch, uh, I'm using my infusion on in the left hand, the surgery is almost finished, I have to just close my corneal wounds and what I'll do is I'll make this small supraincisional tunnel which really, so rather than struggle with trying to hydrate your wounds, if you have a wound which is even slightly leaky or in pediatric cataracts where you really want the wounds to seal well, you just make this small pocket and hydrate the pocket rather than hydrating the edges of the incision. Now once you hydrate the pocket, the roof of the incision, uh, it actually swells up nicely and the wound seals really well. So I've done that for this incision, this incision and this incision. Now I have my three wounds uh, hydrated, but how do I ensure whether they are actually sealed or not? So I used uh, another small uh, innovation uh, where uh, we put uh, trypan blue, uh, just like a seedless test. So a drop of trypan blue on all the three wounds and just watch what is happening. Two wounds are not leaking, these two, but that wound immediately has a positive serial test. Just watch. So immediately there's a stream of uh, aqueous coming out and uh, you will notice that then I try to seal it again and then test again because trypan blue is lying in almost every tray in the OT now in every surgeon. So the, the, it's leaking less now, but it still leaks. So after trying several times, now this video is edited, I tried in this pediatric cataract seven, eight times. I decided that I can't leave this uh, wound un unsecure, either I have to put a suture. So I decided to make another supraincisional pocket on my side port as well, just watch. And it's a simple technique, uh, only thing is your eye has to be tight. So you can switch on infusion or you can put visco inside or you can use a side port to put on your infusion handpiece and then on this pocket you can just hydrate a little bit. The moment you do that, the seals becomes negative again. So it's, uh, it's a very, very easy technique to learn and uh, you can all uh, try this at home and then see if it works for you. I, for me, it works really well. So do I have one more minute to show one last uh, uh, innovation that I'm using? So uh, for my Torix now, uh, although I do use the Virion system, which is really nice, I totally depend upon it. But for the calculations, I'm using the T-cone with the Lenstar which basically is uh, a placido plus a uh, simple uh, keratometry. Now this is what I wanted to show you. There is a Toric planner which comes with the Lenstar which really makes life easy. Now when you use Torics from two or three different companies, you might be using Alcon, Technis and then Hoya and several others. So what happens is you have to go back to the formulas and feed the data into the system to calculate which Toric you are going to use. Now on the Lenstar, this is a nice software which allows you to just calculate for any Toric lens. You don't have to transfer data to an online software and uh, you can easily move around your incision. Just watch, this is my main incision, this is the axis of the lens. I can move my incision in any direction. It's, uh, it's a touch screen and if I move my incision over here at the bottom, you'll see the predicted astigmatism and you can actually aim for a zero astigmatism after you feed your SIA. So if once you move this incision around, the SIA keeps changing and then the lens star will uh, you know, tell you where to position your lens. It really, really makes life simple and you can have calculations for the two or three different toric lenses and aim for emetropia in almost every case. Whether you get it or not is a different story. So I think again, uh, life is making, becoming very much simpler and now uh, we don't uh, have to worry about our uh, designs. And I think this or these kind of softwares will come on almost every machine gradually. Right now the Lenstar does it, but I'm sure they will all uh, get it similar kind of software. With that, sir, I think I'll stop because... Uh, you know, Beautiful. Heard, Thank you so yeah. much. Thank, Thank you, you so sir. much. But just half a question, that Lenstar, the same optical biometer that you're talking about. Yes. Is it a new feature on that? Sir, it, it is available as an upgrade. So it's a software upgrade which you can ask for. And normally they were supplying it with the T-cone, that small cup which comes okay. with the topo okay. with the Placido, but now they give it without that also. Thank and you so much. if you just push them, I don't think they'll charge you for that. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. You, Thank you all for being with us on this morning. Thank you.